Hey, y'all. Good to see everybody. My name is Judah, if we haven't met before. It's just good to be in the house of the Lord. I uh, am excited <clears throat> because uh, we have been in the book of Mark for 21 weeks now. 21 weeks walking through the book of Mark, which is uh, very much a characteristic of Bridgeway Christian Church. It is not uncommon to hear our pastor get on the stage and say, today we are on number 570 of our series through, because uh, we try to be thorough. <clears throat> But we've been walking through the book of Mark, talking about opportunity. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were talking about a story from Mark chapter 8, where Jesus heals a man who is blind. And we talked about how uh, God did that miracle, Jesus did that miracle in two stages to work with the man's pace, with where he was, where he was in his life. Today we're going to walk through uh, another story of Jesus healing, but this time we're going to watch him heal a boy who is possessed by a demon. Oh, fun. So we're going to pray first, and then we'll, we'll dive into this. Uh, Jesus, help. Help us walk through uh, this passage, Lord, with precision, lifting up what you want us to understand, Lord. Teach us richly and allow your spirit to guide the meditations of our hearts and our understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, the thing about Christianity is that like, it has its like, cool, fun parts, and then it has its like, complicated, weird parts. Um, all of it is valuable. All of it is valuable. And what's interesting about the passage that we're going to be looking at today is not just what it says and what it's about, but also where it falls in the narrative of the text. And last week, our principal pastor, Pastor Lance, um, he was teaching on the earlier part of the chapter that we're going to read today. Uh, he's on vacation for the next couple of weeks. He shared with us that uh, he had recently lost his mother-in-law and um, they're taking a little bit of break. So if you don't like the message today, don't email him while he's on vacation, email Brian. Um, <laughs> he was teaching Pastor Lance last week and he was talking to us about how Peter and James and John, they go with Jesus up this mountain and they have revival. They go up this mountain and they experience the full glory of God. They see the physical glory of God on Jesus. And Pastor Lance taught us that God spoke to them from heaven and, and said, this is, this is my son. This is Jesus. He is God. And, and it's this profound experience. Matthew writes about it in his gospel, and he says that Jesus' face shone with the light of the sun, right? So it's this just profound experience that we describe as the transfiguration. It's the Greek word metamorpho, which is where we get the English word metamorphosis, right? Because Jesus has become something more beautiful, more uh, profound uh, in, in front of them. And this is really what we call like a mountaintop experience. You, you ever had one of those? You know, where you just like, you just experience the power of God. It's just wonderful. You just experience it. And the challenge is that they have this mountaintop experience, but as soon as they come down the mountain, Peter, James, John, with Jesus, they run into this crowd of people, and they see in this crowd all of their friends, the other disciples, and they're basically in this big old fight. Because apparently, uh, a father had brought his demon-possessed son to the disciples and asked the disciples to heal the boy, to cast out the demon, and the disciples are not able to deliver the boy, and so now they're getting ready to throw hands in the street over this, this issue. And it's just like, talk about killing the mood, right? Like, like talk about a joy kill. Like, you go from, some of y'all know what this is. It's, it's like when you come to church, and it's so good. Ooh, Pastor Lance just preached down heaven, and didn't he sang so pretty, and the spirit was moving around, and I just felt so encouraged. And then you got to go back home, and you walk into your house with the chaotic people that live with you, 
right? You, you, you know what that feels like. It, it, it's just, it, it, it reminds me that like mountaintop experiences are important, right? They're good. They are catalytic in nature, meaning they propel us forward. But mountaintop experiences don't actually sustain us in the day to day of like doing life. And we can actually become disillusioned with faith when we have a mountaintop experience, but then we have to return to kind of the world as it is in the process of being redeemed. So I wanna talk about that. And I'm gonna give you your fill in the blank at the very end. I'll give you your fill in the blank at the very end. So I'll invite you to turn with me now to Mark chapter nine, verse 14. Mark chapter nine, verse 14. Mark chapter nine. Verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And Jesus asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. They come off this mountain, and they are immediately confronted by human needs by human brokenness. They are confronted with the tension of Christianity, right? The reality that we know God, we know that he's real, we know that he's powerful, we've seen what he can do, and we know that this world has a whole lot of, whole lot of going on, right? And one moment after they literally see Jesus show the fullness of his divinity, they are confronted with a problematic world. It's jarring. It really is. It, it, it's actually, there's this almost dissociative state that, that, that Christians are kind of always walking in as we like navigate kind of both of those realities, the reality of what we know and the reality of what we know. And so they, they, they come to the disciples and they see a bunch of people doing what? Arguing fussing, fighting, likely over method, likely over human failure, you know, caught up in their own pride and, and arrogance. And everybody is so busy trying to be right that they are busy arguing. Meanwhile, there is a boy who has been tormented, who is being regularly assaulted violently by a demon and these disciples can't cast it out. There is something about failure that brings out the worst in us and that distracts us, right? That when we have become unsuccessful, uh, we start focusing on being defensive. I, I won't speak about you, I'll just speak about me. I can be so defensive when I have to look at my failure. Not only defensive, but aggressive, right? And we waste time arguing about failure instead of interrogating it. Why did we fail? And when we look at the disciples who are trying to cast out this demon and failing, the thing that is striking to me is when the disciples are trying to cast the demon out of the boy, where is Jesus? Up the mountain. And so they are trying to do a supernatural thing apart from Jesus. They are facing this spiritual battle. It, 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 it's a human need, but it's a spiritual battle and an extraordinarily difficult situation that is beyond their resources, and they're trying to do it alone. And this is exactly, exactly the same thing we're facing today. When we... When we see this, this passage of scripture, when we look at these disciples, we really should see ourselves, right? That, like we, like them, have been commissioned by Jesus. 
right, to be his representatives. We have been given the authority to act in his name. And we, like them, also are in way over our heads, right? These disciples encountered a boy being tormented by a demon. And here's the thing, you may read this and think, yeah, Judah, but um, I'm not wrestling with no demon. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dealing with a spirit. But actually you are. Ephesians 6 and 12 says, but we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But against the authorities, against the rulers, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, over spiritual wickedness in high places. So what we need to be clear about is that the supernatural is our reality and everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. That's actually the distinction between our worldview as Christians and the world's worldview is that the, 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 we actually know what's going on, right? When our political parties think that they're fighting each other, we know they're not, right? When we, when we think that the enemy is our neighbor, it's not, right? When we are caught up in, in the, the physical of the circumstances, we know that we're actually in a supernatural war against spiritual schemes, and supernatural schemes. And often, the thing about supernatural schemes is that they love to come dressed in normal, natural circumstances. And so what that means is that there are always, there is always more than what we can see and understand going on. And so we always need more than what we can see and understand to navigate it. You know, the sneakiest lie that the adversary likes to tell us, and you got to be careful, it's tricky because it sounds positive, but one of the sneakiest lies that he likes to whisper to us, he likes to say, you got it. You, you can figure it out. And I'm telling you, when he says that to us, he is not trying to encourage us toward resilience. He is trying to push us toward the dangerous human tendency of self-reliance. So every so now and again, we have to pause and just take a look at the enormity of what is set before us and be real clear that there is, there is no task you can do on your own. You can't afford to do anything on your own. Your life is not something you can do on your own. What Jesus has called you to do, the life that he has called you to live, who he has called you to be, you cannot do. It is humanly impossible and sometimes I think we need to recognize that instead of standing around arguing. The funny thing is, we always become hyper aware of this truth every time we get into a real bad crisis, don't we? When it get real bad, all of a sudden, we, the amnesia goes away, we'd be like, Lord, please, only you can do it, you're the only one, help me, right? And then Jesus steps in and he helps as if he hadn't been there the whole time, wanting to help, waiting to help, asking you to let him be God in your life. He comes and he helps, fixes the problem. And then as soon as the problem is solved, we go right back to that amnesia, don't we? And I speak for myself, that's all right. <laughs> I said, they'll look at me like you're cute if you want to. <laughs> what are the things that you think are too small to ask Jesus to help you with? What are the things you think that you, you got figured out? Hmm. The disciples are surrounded by this crowd and they are, they are trying to convince the crowd of their competence, right? What a waste of time, right? And the reason that they're doing this is because not only have they failed, but they have failed publicly. It's one thing to fail in the privacy of your own house, you understand? It's one thing to fall apart privately, but they have failed public, publicly, fallen flat on their face 
in front of a whole crowd. There's nothing like when your failure is witnessed. That's why I always have a little bit of grace and compassion for famous people and politicians and the, you know, the folks whose all their stuff is on the news. If I mess up, it ain't but about two or three people that's gonna know what I got going on. But, but imagine having it blasted everywhere. And, and so the, the, the scribes are now arguing with the disciples and the father is frustrated and the boy is still being tormented. And I, I thought about this and I thought, man, that looks like the world today, that some of us are arguing and some of us are frustrated and nobody is any better off. And this is the path that self-reliance takes us down. Notice Jesus' rebuke in verse 19. And he answered them, he said, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? I want you to notice who he's talking to. Because it'd be easy to assume that he's speaking to the disciples because they're the ones who have failed. But he doesn't say, oh, faithless disciples. He says, oh, faithless generation. He says, all y'all, all of us, that this isn't a problem, this self-reliance that is restricted to just a few people, that it is really a problem that has affected the generation. He's clarifying that it, the problem is not that the demon is too powerful. The demon was powerful, right? He, he says in verse 29 that, that this kind can only come out by prayer. So he's, he's showing us that there is distinction with whatever the spirit was. But the problem, according to Jesus, is, is not actually the demon. Jesus doesn't seem to get frustrated with the demon. He is frustrated by a people who are always trying to do things on their own. He's clarifying for us there is a right way and a wrong way to handle spiritual problems, which is all problems because everything is spiritual. And the right way Jesus answers in verse 28, it says, and when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Some versions say prayer and fasting. And it is not that prayer and fasting make us more worthy to cast out demons. It's that prayer and fasting draw us closer to the heart of God. That prayer and fasting are an expression of total obedience and total dependence on him. And, and I think if we, really, if we really understood our level of vulnerability and the precarious nature that we are always in. We might actually do what Paul said to the church in Thessalonica. Paul told them, pray without ceasing. He said, don't stop praying. Pray all day, every day about everything. Talk to God about it all. And, and it is not because we are trying to get access to something new, right? But it is because that, that what God has already given us, the authority that he has already given us, he already gave the disciples the authority to cast out demons in Mark chapter 3. And accessing that is cultivated through, that's, that's through connection. And prayer, I think it is the most underutilized tool that we have. I think it is also the most effective tool that we have. It, it is the way that we create not create, that we cultivate that connection. Prayer is about alignment. Prayer is about positioning. It's about being in the prime position to access and understand what Jesus is up to. This idea of total dependence on God. We practice most, mostly dependence on God. But this idea of total dependence on God is the remedy for spiritual problems, which is all problems. Again, because everything is spiritual. And so look, I, I'm sorry if you came to church today hoping to hear something brand new and exciting. I go back to the text and what it says. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Paul says, don't stop praying. And, and, and it's easy to look at that and think, well, he can't be telling us literally, don't stop praying, because I would be praying 24 hours a day. Yeah, correct, right? I want us to, to get to a place where we see prayer 
as a fully fleshed out activity, that it is the thing to do, right? And I'm not telling you that, that you cannot pray and also incorporate some of the other things that you wanna do. Uh, prayer is a great multitasking opportunity, right? Prayer goes great with brainstorming, it goes great with confrontation, it goes great with creativity, it goes great with taking medicine, it goes great with finding strategy. You can pray and run. I know this for sure because we are um, in the middle of our BYA camping retreat and I was up there with them uh, last night and on Friday night and uh, on Friday night, I, I, was, I was sitting there with my laptop, I was looking at this, and a, a bear decided to come wandering through the camp. So I just want you to know, I'm a testimony. You can pray and run. Glory to God, you can. It goes great, it goes great together. And the thing is, if you pray and run, and you miss the bus, that wasn't your bus. But if you just run and you don't pray, you might end up on the wrong bus, right? The disciples did not speak to their savior before trying to solve their problem and so they ended up disappointed in themselves and, and to be disappointed in yourself is to have trusted yourself but the reality is you and your humanity are not trustworthy. Now, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm not saying you're not integrous. I'm not saying you're not wise. I'm not saying you're not learned. I'm not saying you're not a good person. I am saying that you know that you are not actually trustworthy. I am not trustworthy. And this, 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 this idea of self-reliance, it, it really is, it is the mindset of the devil. Because Satan believes that he can do things on his own. Satan believes that he should do things on his own. You see how that turned out? This, this idea of self-reliance, it is what makes the world secular. The world is not secular because the world has disagreements with the church on issues. The world is secular because the world thinks that it can and should do things on its own. And when Christians and churches start to adopt that mentality, we end up in situations where we fail publicly. We end up in situations where people come to us in need and they leave undelivered. It is not enough to simply come to church once a week and hope that the teacher gives you a good answer. The disciples themselves had just been with Jesus the week before, the teacher of teachers. And still, the moment that they forsook their opportunity to communicate with their God, to speak to their Savior, to consult with him, they lost all their power and it led to chaos. I believe 100% of the problems in the world are not being solved because Christians are not praying enough. And when I say praying enough, I want to be real careful for my friends who are tempted easily by legalism that we are not trying to determine the number of times a day you're supposed to be praying. Paul did not say, pray 20 times a day. He said, don't stop praying. And what's wild to me about this, this text is that the disciples choose not to speak to Jesus about a problem, not any old regular problem, not, oh, Jesus, should I buy the house or should I apply for the job or should I sell the car? They chose not to consult with him about demon possession. You, you. <laughs> the thing is, stuff about demons is like slightly weird, right? Like, it, it's, it's, it's a little creepy. You would think, that out of all the things that maybe we should send them a text, an email, it would be demonic. But listen, in the year of our Lord, 2024, when we have the entire New Testament to tell us, you know, a little bit about what to think about how 
demons work and what we should do about it. We, we have that whole New Testament to help inform it. They didn't have that. They were living it. They didn't have that. We have so many books and theologians and scholars that have studied the, the branch of theology that is around uh, the supernatural evil in the world, the demonology, and even still, it's complicated and we don't have it all figured out, right? It's complicated for a lot of reasons. The, the, thing, the thing that makes it really hard to kind of understand how we should be thinking about demons and what we should do uh, in terms of, 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 of fighting them is, is, is first and foremost in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where we see demonic possession talked about, it is talked about using uh, several different uh, types of language, right? So there are kind of three ways that, that, that we translate in English somebody having a demon. There, there, there's, there's the language that we translate to somebody has an unclean spirit, right? And, and, and that's like in Matthew 8, and Matthew, uh, Mark 5, and, and Luke 8. Then there's, there's another set of language that we translate in English to uh, having a demon, right? That's in Mark 1 and Luke 4. And then there's, then there's another way that it's said it, somebody is demon-possessed, right? And these terms, they all indicate the presence of some kind of unclean spirit or demon who is exacting a degree of either regular or intermittent influence over someone's life. There are lots of arguments about what these terms mean. Do they mean demonic possession? Do they mean demonic oppression? Do they mean demonic influence? And to what degree? Not only that, but it is hard for us to have distinction on what these phrases mean because we bring Western eyes to an old Eastern text. So the ways that we think about supernatural things as Westerners in the 21st century is a little bit different than the Eastern authors who wrote it, right? So that makes it complicated for us to figure out, okay, what do we, what do, we do with this? Not only that, but everywhere in the New Testament where we see demonic influence, possession, oppression mentioned, the 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 examples vary significantly from one to another. And the examples of demonic possession in the New Testament often uh, talk about demons who produce symptoms that are difficult to distinguish from just illnesses that might just be the result of a fallen world, right? We see in the New Testament sometimes it, demons show up and it, it shows up looking like blindness or muteness or, or deafness or seizures. And like we also know that just because you're deaf doesn't mean that you got a demon. Just because you're blind doesn't mean that you got a demon. And just because you have seizures doesn't mean that you have a demon, right? So it's hard to distinguish, okay, what are we looking for? There are times when in the New Testament, demons show up and they present or they mimic uh, psychological and psychiatric disorders, right? Uh, folks running around naked, folks self-harming, folks uh, isolating, right? Even this boy in our story who is possessed by a demon, his symptoms show up and look very much like epilepsy. And again, we know that just because you got a psychiatric condition doesn't necessarily mean that you have a demon. It makes it difficult for us to determine, you know, if someone is being influenced by a demon and the level of influence and, you know, what do we do when we think that they are? And, and the truth is that a lot of harm has been done by the church when we get this wrong, right? So you would think, disciples, that you would, you would at least talk to Jesus before you start trying to navigate this area. The good thing is that we, we know that, that, that this is not something that we need to be afraid of or a battle or an issue that we need to avoid talking about. Demons are a spiritual problem. We need to have a spiritual answer. In the Bible, the most common spiritual answer or remedy for demonic influence, right, is simply the application of the spiritual authority that Jesus has given to his followers, right? This is most accomplished in the New Testament by people simply casting the spirit out in Jesus' name. Now, I want to be clear, 
in Jesus' name is not this magic set of words. It, it is recognizing that Jesus, by his own authority, told demons to leave, and they had to leave. And, so, and then he told us that we would have that same authority, that same power as his representatives. He said that we would be able to do what he did and greater things as his representative. So then we keep reading our Bible, and we get to the, 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 the book of Acts, and we see the New Testament church, the New Testament believers, not just the pastors, not just the, the intercessors, but the people who are part of the New Testament church, we saw them doing this all the time. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were greatly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, the sent ones. Then skip down to verse 16. The people also gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, what is weird about the passage that we're reading, right, is that these disciples who are at the bottom of the mountain, they know that they have the authority in Jesus' name. They know how they've seen demons cast out before, and it is likely that when this boy is brought to them, that they, they, they did just that. That they probably said, come out of him in Jesus' name. And you know, they probably said it all loud and dramatic. You know how we get when we get charismatic and excited. You know, we get to hollering and screaming and stuff, right? They probably did just that. And why didn't it work? And we're not, we're not positive. But I would submit to you this, that you can probably say in Jesus' name and Jesus not be anywhere present that you probably can do the formula of the thing, you can perform the act, but if you are separated from Jesus relationally, there is no power. And I just think that if they had just talked to Jesus, had a conversation with him, before they tried to solve the spiritual problem, that Jesus would have clarified whatever it was they were working with and whatever they needed to do to be successful in finding a solution for that problem. Jesus says this kind only comes, comes out through prayer. And I want you to notice where Jesus gives them that instruction. It is privately. It is in a one-on-one -on -one conversation or a one on however many there were with them in the privacy of their relationship. When they ask, Jesus, why, why couldn't we do it? What's going on with this? This kind can only come out by prayer. The strength of a believer's connection, communication, and relationship with Jesus is really the key to finding answers. And it is the key to dealing with anything, even the weird stuff that we don't quite understand. And what's super, super kind of ironic about this passage is that the only person who seems to figure this out, who seems to get like the most amount of clarity about this, is, is not the disciples. It, it is the person who has come to them. It is, it is the boy's father. It is, it's the person that doesn't go to church, which is, which is interesting. Look at verse 17. And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? So you notice now they're having a dialogue. This is a conversation. And the father said from childhood and it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can, he said, all things are possible for one who believes. Now the thing is, we read that line, all things are possible for the one who believes. And we think that it is Jesus wagging his finger at us saying, if you just believed more, all things would be possible for you. But that is not what he is saying here. I want you to remember Verse 19, in verse 19, Jesus answered them, O faithless generation. So he says to them, all of you, all of us, 
do not have the faith that we need to have. Then he says in verse 23, all things are possible for one who believes. So if everybody has tried to cast this demon out and been unsuccessful because they don't have enough faith, and then Jesus says, all things are possible for the one who believes, and then Jesus is the one who casts the demon out, then when he says, all things are possible for the one who believes, who is the one he's talking about? Himself that he is pointing back to himself. It's an encouragement because what he is saying is, where you have not had enough faith, I got enough faith. He is saying, I believe in myself. I will make up where you lack, where you don't have enough faith to believe and to get the healing and to get the miracle, where you drop the ball, I will do the rest. I love this. And, and, And it teaches us that for the disciples, their issue actually wasn't that they didn't believe that they could cast the demon out. They believed that they could, that's why they tried. What they struggled with in belief actually comes in Mark chapter eight, just turn there briefly, Mark chapter eight, verse 31. It says, and Jesus began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Right? So so Jesus says, Faith is the belief that all things are possible. And the issue here is that Jesus' disciples, that they did not believe one fundamental thing. They did not believe that it was necessary for Jesus to suffer and die and be resurrected in three days again. Essentially, they did not believe the gospel. They did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was going to do what he said he was going to do, and that it was necessary. And so for them, the big task actually wasn't about casting out the demon. It was about believing in Jesus. And if they believed what he had told them, then they would have had the good sense to check in with him before they started trying to cast out demons, right? So Jesus says, all things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, but help my unbelief. And it is this father having this deep awareness of his self-inadequacy instead of self-reliance. And he cries out to his savior and he says, I can't do it. He says this in front of this entire crowd, the scribes, the disciples, even in front of his son, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running, verse 25, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And what I love so much about this is that Jesus does not expect the father to overcome his own doubt before he gives him this miracle, right? That this child is not raised because the father has perfect faith. Jesus says, I don't need you to have perfect faith. I have perfect faith. I am the one who believes. So all things are possible for me. What I do demand from you is connection. What I do demand from you It's communication. you got to talk to me. you got to engage with me. We will figure out the rest along the way. But you cannot do this thing and not be in communion with me, not talk to me, not not pray to me. You ain't got to have the perfect words. Help my unbelief is not eloquent. But you do got to speak to me. You do got to engage with me. And that's the formula. That that is the solution to all of your spiritual problems. And all of your problems are spiritual because everything is spiritual. The solution is humility mixed with prayer. 
dependence mixed with relationship. And what we see is that when somebody is humble enough to pray, Jesus responds. Jesus steps in and solves this whole problem. The father does not lift a finger in this solution. Doesn't help Jesus at all. Jesus does it. And, 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 and he does it because it's his will to do so. Which reminds us that prayer is not the way that we get Jesus to do what we want to do. Prayer is the way that we come to terms with his will. Prayer is the space that we come to to get right priorities. To get right, it's the word ortho, right perspective, doxy, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, right practice, right understanding. And, and I will tell you, it, it's comforting because it means, that, it means that we actually don't have to understand all the ins and outs of our problems, including demonology. We don't have to understand all of the, the details of how that, that supernatural piece works because what we have is, is good theology. It's a theology of a crucified and resurrected Savior. That's what the disciples missed in Mark 8, that that is the theology we have a, a theology of a resurrected Jesus who is able to do all things, whose faith in his own Father and in himself makes the space for all of our problems to be solved. And so it is to that Savior that we pray without ceasing. Because we know, if we're honest, that we actually don't know anything, that, we, that we, actually, we actually can't figure out nothing, that we actually can't solve not one single problem, that we're actually not as smart as we think we are, as intelligent as we think we are, as creative as we think we are, as skilled as we think we are. We just, we just kind of are quite helpless. And because we know that, and we also know that we can come to him and ask for help, and while we believe, at least enough to get up on a Sunday morning and come to church, we ask him to help us with our unbelief. Because we know even that falls short. That even that is not quite enough. And we thank him because he believes and because of that all things are possible for us. So here's your fill in the blank. Y'all forgot about the fill in the blank, huh? Get out your pens, get out your pens, get out your pens. Here's your fill in the blank. If Jesus is present, then deliverance is possible. Scratch out that if. Write this underneath. When Jesus is present, then deliverance is possible. Scratch that out too. Write this. <laughs> Only when Jesus is present, then deliverance is possible. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> Only when Jesus is present, deliverance is possible. So here's your call to action. Uh, pray. As simple as that is, pray. Let us become a praying church. A church that prays is more powerful than a church with good programs. A church that prays is more powerful than a church with dynamic worship and, 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 and entertaining or engaging preachers. A church that prays is more powerful than a church that does community service and raises funding and has good children's ministry. Let us be a praying church. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop. We'll start now. Father, in Jesus' name, uh, I repent for just the ways that I, I try to do so much stuff out of my own flesh, Lord. And I repent on behalf of my friends for the fact that we are so tied up in that. And we ask that you would help us to uh, be freed from, from, from that temptation to depend on ourselves, God, especially when you provide it all. Father, remind us this week 
to pray more, to talk to you more, to bring all of our problems to your feet. And I thank you, God, that you are the God who hears, that you bend yourself low to hear, and then you respond to us. Father, we need to be uh, equipped for the spiritual problems that we're going to face. And we understand that the only way that that is possible is if we are communing with you, that that has to be our priority. Help us to do that, Lord, in your name, amen. Uh, Prayer team will be up here. Have a good weekend, church.